Hi, this is Cherie Burton and welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. This is a podcast for women who long to feel, express, and be who they truly are, who they were created to become. Today we've got Brooke Snow, who has her own podcast, the Brooke Snow Podcast. You can check her out on brooksnow.com. Meditation can seem ominous. It can seem frustrating. It does require a degree of mentoring, especially if you're kind of a novice just entering into this whole realm of how do I go within? How do I get still? How do I quiet my mind? We totally explored that in this episode, and it was super powerful for me, who tends to be in her head a lot, (laughs) especially as it relates to Christ-centered meditation. So no matter what your persuasion, uh, your faith tradition, or your spiritual path. For me, it's Christ. For her, it's Christ. You can insert whatever that aligns for you in terms of your spiritual master or teacher or even presence of the divine. But having that embodied Christ has been especially powerful for me as I think of him being within me and alongside me, not above me or beneath me or anything like that, but just right there with me. So we talk about that presence and how you sort of cultivate that. Really, that's her passion is bringing people into spiritual awareness and taking them on a journey of inner exploration and claiming their soul sovereignty. So you'll love our discussion as we climb into that. And on those same lines, before we head into our discussion together, I wanted to direct you to my website, shereeburton.com. This week, I'll be launching the Soul Declaration Cards. I've been working on these for a long time. It's a set of 27 cards that have a front and back component of affirmations on one side, really empowering divine feminine and soul sovereignty I am statements. And then on the reverse side is an aff formation framed in the form of a question relevant to that affirmation. And these questions are about inquiry, opening, creating a space to go within. And actually questions do open. They open your soul, they open your mind and heart. So that's those affirmations are on the reverse side of those cards. So I love the verbiage that we've been able to pull together for those. And it's, I think, leading right into this discussion of meditation, opening the mind, opening the heart, creating a safe and secure space to the you can speak the language of your soul and your soul can speak back. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I know that you have a podcast where you really, it's a spiritual podcast, right? And share the name of it. It's just your name, right? Or what is it? The Brooke Show? Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> it is the Brooke Snow Show. Brooke Snow. <laughs> Snow is my last name. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> and it's really, it's self-help with a gospel core. So we get to explore lots of self-help things, but I always support it with the gospel foundation. That's my favorite thing to do is connect those dots together. Yeah. And f- I know everyone has a different... Um, their own sort of paradigm about what the gospel is. I mean, even within people of the same religion, they see what the gospel is very differently. Some people see the gospel as like a set of rules. Some people see the gospel as, I mean, and that's wrong, by the way. (laughs) I'm telling you that's wrong. Um, No, but you know what I mean? Everyone has a different perspective or perception. There you go around what the gospel is for me. and, And I'd love for you to define it for me. It's the good, literally the good news is what I've seen I've kind of seen that um, translation before. I also see it as a way of being. I see like everyone is is a walking gospel in terms of how they let light in and how God expresses through that person. So for me, it's not necessarily a set of standards as much as it is a way of being. So that for me is the good news of like, be yourself. So that's the gospel according to Cherie. Um, How would you define (laughs) the gospel? (laughs) Well, I love the way that you've defined it. I think it's really personal that way. And for me, I know growing up in a church that is very, you know, organized and it has a, a very profound and clear culture about it. Um, it's taken me a few years, especially as we'll get into talking about meditation and stuff like that. It's taken me a few years to switch the order that I have between me and the Lord. I think like growing up, it used to be Lord is at the top and then it's the church and then I'm underneath. And so it was kind of like I was experiencing the gospel through organized religion. Mm -hmm. And in the last few years, I've, I've turned that I've kind of flipped it around. And so it's the Lord and then me, and then my experience with church supports what I already have as a personal experience with Jesus Christ. So okay, change changed my mind. That's my gospel definition. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. It's like, so really like when I go ahead, it's not hierarchical. Gospel is not hierarchical. It's, it's yeah. so personal. It's God. It, it's like, yeah. there's no, he employs no servant at the gate. It's you and him. Yeah, exactly. That's what the at one meant is, right? The atonement. And so for me, when I talk about the gospel in my podcast, it's all individual. It's ways that I've found to apply the atonement to my life, ways that I've found to apply truths I've found in the scriptures to support principles that I'm learning. And so it's it's very personalized mm. that way. So um, one of the former leaders of our faith, a, a, a prophet of our faith, David McKay, he gave a really powerful definition of meditation. And I'm sure you've heard it before, but mm-hmm. he said it's the most yes. secret, sacred door to which we pass through the presence of the Lord. Like you can pray or you can, what is it? He's like, it's like you can go to worship service or go to the temple or whatever, and it doesn't even come close. To, and I'm totally paraphrasing. It's like, those are great forms of worship, but the true worship or the true um, way to be with the, in the presence of the Lord is through meditation. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I am so curious about how this came to be for you, how you became a meditation expert and you can totally claim that title by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and how you really, how it spoke to you, what, how it came about. And usually, usually it's cloaked in some kind of a pain point story, but Share with us sort of how that came to be for you. So several years ago, it's probably been five, four or five years ago now, I had just had a baby and I had a near-death experience with that. I had nine pulmonary embolisms, which I didn't know what that was. That's blood clots to the lungs Mm. and I couldn't breathe (laughs) and it was it was a really terrifying experience. And really my meditation experience starts here. I didn't realize that it started here for another couple of years, but I was in the hospital. I couldn't breathe at all. And I was transferred into an ambulance and then from the ambulance into a helicopter, a life flight helicopter that would fly me to another hospital. And in the in the first hospital and in the ambulance, I had 20 liters of oxygen that were over my nose and my mouth, helping me to be able to breathe. Uh, without wow. that support, I would die. And when we transferred from the ambulance into the life flight helicopter, the helicopter did not have that level of oxygen. So... 20 liters, just to give you an idea, it's kind of like a fire hose (laughs) of oxygen just like blasting in and the helicopter just didn't have that pressure. I don't know if it's called pressure. I don't know what the proper medical term is, but it didn't have that intensity. And so when they changed over my mask to that lower pressure, they had 15 liters of oxygen in the uh, helicopter, I knew immediately this is not enough and I will not live. Wow. And anyone has had that experience of just not being able to breathe. It is a terrifying experience. <laughs> we rely on that just, you know, for right, right. survival. And it's, it's usually one of the functions of the body that, you know, we don't have to think about it, right? Like it happens unconsciously until all of a sudden it's not happening. And I remember as soon as that mask was shifted over and I couldn't breathe any longer, it was just, it really was a near death moment where I knew that I needed a miracle and I was prayerful this whole entire time. But in the, in that moment, the phrase that entered into my mind was Christ is the breath of life. Mm. And I began to repeat that phrase with my entire soul (laughs) on every inhale and exhale that I could possibly try to do in those circumstances. And it was just, I repeated it over and over. Inhale, Christ is the breath of life. Exhale, Christ is the breath of life over and over. And it was amazing to see what happened in that moment. The EMT was previously 
just like, you know, a medical movie or something like that. She's like, Brooke, come back to us. We're losing her. We're losing her. And then Mm. this phrase manifests into my mind and I begin to repeat it and to repeat it and to repeat it. And then the EMT says, I can't believe it. This is a miracle. She's stabilizing. Mm. And I mean, that to me was the moment that my life was saved. And I do credit, I do credit, of course, God for saving my life. I credit the um, Western medicine and all of the people that helped. And of course, I also credit like the power of mantra and breath. Absolutely. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't until two years later, after I had gotten into studying about meditation that I actually looked back on that experience. And I realized for the first time, Mm -hmm. the Lord gave me a mantra. He -hmm. gave me a mantra and he told me to repeat it on every inhale and exhale. And it saved my life. That is so beautiful. I have chills everywhere. You know, (laughs) well, you know, mantra, when you break it down, it means mind vehicle. Like that's the Sanskrit. um, I think it's Sanskrit. And so it's like, it's a vehicle for your mind to heal something. So that's amazing that you were given that like in the very hour, literally in the very moment that you needed that. Right. And breath itself, how, how powerful of a teacher, because you and I both know breath in and of itself, um, we aren't breathing. We are being breathed. You can't, Mm -hmm. it's impossible to die by holding your breath. If it's not your time to go, you will be breathed involuntarily. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and so breath in and of itself is so powerful. So for you to have that experience with breath, losing, literally losing your breath. How old was your baby? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it happened the baby? same day. This so she was hours old. <laughs> really? She, oh. she was, born, she was born in the morning and this happened um, in the evening about 10 PM. So I was taken from the hospital, left my baby there. Didn't see her for a whole week. Like it was a pretty, oh, it was a my drug. gosh. Traumatic experience for sure. <laughs> was this your first baby or? No, this was my second. And, you know, from that experience, I'll just share a little bit more of the meditation story, but it was a really powerful spiritual experience for me. And I knew that I had been saved. I was so grateful, so grateful to be alive, um, to know that I had been preserved to be able to raise this baby that I just had and to continue to do good work on the earth. And I thought because the experience was so spiritual that I was fine. But about six months to a year later, I started experiencing PTSD symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'd be driving and I'd see a helicopter flying in the sky and I'd have a panic attack. And I didn't realize I was having panic attacks. I just thought I was super emotional. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I was just really sentimental, but I'd drive my son to school and drop him off at kindergarten. I nearly burst into tears every day. I just felt really on edge and panic attacks and anxiety. And my husband started to travel a lot as well and leaving me at home with two kids. And I just wasn't in a mentally healthy place to be able to handle all of those responsibilities. And one day I was talking to my sister about it and just sharing with her how anxious I was and the PTSD and she should, she's actually the one who suggested to me that I consider doing meditation to be able to calm the anxiety and to help these panic attacks and things like that. She's like, I think it could really help you. And she was uh, familiar with a meditation class. It was a Kundalini yoga meditation class. And so that's where I began. I knew that I I needed to try something because life was just so difficult under those circumstances. So we signed up together for this class. It was a 40 day challenge. And I think if it wasn't a challenge and I didn't have my sister, I probably would have quit. Um, in fact, I know I would have, but there is a competitive spirit in me. And I, I knew that I wanted to get that 
consecutive 40 days. And I, of course, I started noticing immediate results. But, you know, when you consider it over the arc of a 40 day period, like it totally, it really did change the way that I felt. I mean, it was like night and day different. My anxiety was reduced. I was able to not lose my temper. (laughs) I actually Mm -hmm. had more peace and more happiness. And I mean, that was the only thing that I had changed was this meditation practice. And it wasn't long. It was pretty short, but I will say the Kundalini yoga meditation is what I started with. And it's very strict and it was very unfamiliar. And I did feel weird doing it. Yeah. When I started doing Kundalini, I felt like a freak. I was like, is this legal? Like, (laughs) (laughs) but yes, it's very like, it's kundalini. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but I learned in my yoga um, training that kundalini is the only clinically researched yoga form. And so mm-hmm. they've done some, some really powerful clinical research with how it cleanses with the breath and the third, you know, the third eye, which is, uh-huh. you know, that place, that chakra point in the middle of the, um, the center of the mind brain. So yeah, but Kundalini is very rigid. It's very, very disciplined. I guess that's a better word. Um, and it, and that's sometimes that's the power of it, right? Because people need the, you know, the structure. Yeah. Well, I would say there's in the world of meditation, there's definitely a spectrum. And I would say Kundalini is like all the way on the structured side. Like it is super strict. There's mantras that you repeat. There are different mudras or hand movements that you do with your hands. It is timed down to the minute of like everything that you're supposed to do. Yes. <laughs> you have to say and, that for like 10 then, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the it. opposite side... The opposite side of the spectrum is what I actually teach now in my class, but it's very unstructured and exploratory. And it's basically a prayer with the Lord that is meditative. And I can go into detail about what that looks like in a minute, but I want people to understand that there is a spectrum there and there's meditation that's kind of in the middle. I would say that's, you know, Eastern meditation of it's not necessarily Christian at all. It's just, um, becoming in tune with your own mind and your body. Um, very neutral, I guess I could say that way. Mm -hmm. And, and that can just be focusing on the breath and it could just be something really simple too. And so there is this big spectrum and my experience, like I say, I started with the Kundalini. I thought it was totally wild. I mean, I'm wearing like a white turban on my head and like doing all sorts of (laughs) chanting. This was so foreign to the culture that I grew up in. I did wonder, I'm like, what? Is this okay for me to do this? And yet, and yet I experienced profound transformative results. I know that it works. Um, Absolutely. But the problem... The problem I found like after doing this for months, like I probably did 120 days and I found that I started to believe that I had to go through this really strict meditation before I was worthy to be able to pray to God. And that's our old programming. Don't you think like if you, if you match the, the checklist or the set of criteria, then you might be in a place where you can actually be in the presence of God. We have been Mm -hmm. so programmed with it inadvertently. I wouldn't say nefariously, just that's the programming we get is we could only hope to, like there's a certain set of worthiness standards before we're ready to be in the presence of God. And perhaps the the meditation was helping those old patterns to surface. I, in the, in the moment though, connected it with Kundalini. And I thought, I think this is making me think this. Really, it was probably, like you say, just helping things to cleanse and surface. I'm like, what? (laughs) So I, for me, in that, at that time, when I realized I had this fear or this belief, I knew I wanted to keep meditating, but I knew I needed to do it in a way where I felt like I can come to the Lord just as I am right now in this moment. I don't have to do any special, um, 
long, <laughs> repetitive things to be able to get to that point. Like I need to do it right now. And yeah. so for me, I stopped, I stopped doing the Kundalini. Um, and I just started to explore on my own. I'm like, well, what would, what would meditation look like if it was totally Christ-centered? And, and for many people, Kundalini is Christ-centered. It just depends on your paradigm about it. But um, I came across a quote one day by Soren Kierkegaard. He's a Danish philosopher, 18th century Danish philosopher. And it changed my whole life. <laughs> and I'm going to paraphrase and I'm not going to get it correct, but he said, at first, a man thought that prayer was talking until he became even more quiet and realized that prayer is listening. Mm. And for me, I realized my experience with prayer, my whole life had been me doing all the talking. (laughs) Yeah. And occasionally I would, I'd wait for a, maybe a word, like a yes or a no, if I'd asked a question that was a yes or no question, or just like an impression or a feeling. And I had never considered before that prayer could actually be God talking to me, like in sentences or paragraphs, like having an actual conversation, like we're having right now where we talk back and forth. Yeah. And I really wanted to explore what what would that be like to I think, actually have I think that in experience? church, like, yeah, I think in church, like growing up, I've asked myself, like, am I missing something? Cause I, cause you know, you like you're kneeling down to pray or you're saying a prayer in your mind and you're just waiting for the answer. And what I know now, and I'm sure you can speak to this, like you, your mind and heart, typically, unless you're in a place of danger or warning where you need that signal right away, like you, where you receive that mantra, those can, de- those sentences yeah. can definitely happen. But what I didn't realize is there's a preparatory place to, of stillness that, mm-hmm. um, I must proactively put myself into because I have this body that's running on stress hormones, um, that it's too difficult to discern when God is speaking to me. And for some people, it comes through completely different. They feel it viscerally in their body. They'll kind of have a knowing in their body. So, so I'm curious about how you, how you put yourself in that place not just maybe during an actual meditative practice, which I believe everyone needs, and I know you do too, but even like throughout the day, like how do you get there? And I've been trying to bring people to that place for a while in a very simple way. And I think it's breath, but it's also just like, how do you like push the paddles, right? The the, the, uh, cardio paddles (laughs) um, to... Mm -hmm to do the reset button, no matter where you are, how do you bring that meditation into life? So I'm super curious about that process too. I think I'll just say really quickly, the more you practice this, the faster it is to get to that place. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're first starting it, it, it's a skill. It's like a skill that has to be built. It's a muscle that has to be built. And that's why I'm grateful that my first introduction to meditation was a challenge of doing it for 40 days. A lot of us struggle with the consistency of something, especially something that's so small, but it's not until time has passed and you've done something consistently that it has the time to compound into something that's really great. So practicing this makes it faster to be able to get into that place. For me, getting to that place is breath. And that's like my number one spirituality hack for anybody like me too. I, some people are some people are surprised when I tell them like um I don't meditate the first thing in the morning. I actually do yoga first. And it for me it's because I, that's how my body and my spirit align and I'm one with my body. It's it's clearing any energies out or thoughts out or anything like that so that I can be completely present. And then I feel prepared. I'm in that space to be able to meditate. And th- it doesn't have to be something that takes a long time. Like I, I do like 30 minutes of yoga in the morning, but 
really what I'm trying to say is it can be as simple and as short as three long, deep cleansing inhales and inhale inhales and exhales in your body. Whenever right. I go to pray, or I'll even, I'll even say like, if you want to get more from your scripture study, do three deep inhales and exhales before you read. <laughs> like, if you, and, and even for me, like when I, when I do mentoring with people, um, we start our mentor session with three deep inhales and exhales. Like we yeah. center ourselves. I, I start the all my first. stuff, all my events, everything, all my, all my classes and everything online. Yep. It always, always starts with that because it is that natural cleanser. It is that like, boom. Yes. Yeah. And it's so powerful and simple and free. And until you've actually experienced it, 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 it can be maybe a little baffling to like have faith in the fact that just, oh, three inhales and exhales could change my life that much, but it can, it can totally change your day. It can totally change your, your mood. It can change your emotion that you're feeling. It can reduce the level of anxiety immediately. Like it can totally bring that down. I mean, you could be at like a level 10 and do three inhales, exhales. You could bring that down to a seven and then do some more and you bring it down to a six. And you know, like that's yeah. the, that's okay. where if that was my your only tool. If that's all you had, um, I think we, we overcomplicate the healing process. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. and it is actually virtually impossible to be in an anxious state if you're breathing correctly. What I mean by correctly is that um, and I'm sure you can take us through it too, but it's not chest breathing where you're, you know, totally like using your upper body. Um, it mm -hmm. could be as you start, but eventually the goal is to do that deep belly breathing where you're inhaling, exhaling mm -hmm. your tummy and that diaphragmatic breathing, because that takes you out of the fight or flight response super quickly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And when so, you're, oh, go ahead. I just say when you're in that place where you're calmer and you're more open, then you can handle it, all of the things that come at you, like family dynamics. They're <laughs> easier when you're in that good place. And just the way you respond to coworkers or to other people in the world or to your responsibilities or your crazy schedule or whatever it is, everything is more doable and yes. easy when you're in that spot. Hundred um, percent, and I feel like. Well, let me share with you. Um, so, I was coaching someone once, and I was trying to bring her into a space where she could feel God. Honestly, uh, she wanted to. I wasn't putting that on her. I wasn't like, "You need God." She's like, "I am desperately. I feel desperately disconnected." Were her exact words. And mm. I said, well, I talked to her about breath a little bit and, and we worked through that and, and kind of my next space with people. And this is, I'm sure where you will come in with your practical stuff, especially with the Christ centered meditation is I wanted her to feel like Christ or the presence of the Lord, presence of God was with her and in her not mm -hmm. because the disconnection was like, I'm here. God's over there. She felt like she had to do all these things. And she's like, I logically know that, you know, he, he's probably there. Like I get it, but why can't I feel that? Like why, like I logically, you know, I know all the scriptures. I know all the quote unquote Sunday school answers. Like I've been raised with all of this, but I can't feel it. And so one of the, the things that I have noticed just in my work, especially in I, when I do one-on-ones, is that if we're going into any kind of a visualization exercise where, where um, I have them bring Christ in, or for some people, it's a different figure, like a, a guide or something. But if I have them bring that, that form of what they represent as deity or a higher power in, almost nine times out of 10, when I bring that person in, that person is far away. So like in her case, when we tried to bring Jesus in, who she wanted to connect to, when we brought him into the visualization and we breathe, when we were breathing, there was a fear. It was like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I'm such a sinner. I'm so broken. I don't deserve this. And so he was always like across the field. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And 
I've, I've really sat with that over the years of what we're missing in our way of teachings, uh, you know, about deity and God, like, why do we create that space? Um, so I think that's where we have to do the inner work of making that, you know, using our senses, whether it's visual receptors in our mind's eye or breath, where we literally like break that chasm and build that bridge so that there, we can experience that oneness that we're meant to feel here, not just know, but actually have that direct experience. And there's no, for me, and I'm sure you know, I'm sure you would agree. It has to be done with meditation and, and meditation being, um, connection. Yeah. I have a lot to say to what you just shared there. Um, two things in particular. The first is I 100% relate to your clients that you're coaching. I had a coach that invited me to imagine that I was in the same room as Jesus Christ when I was praying and I couldn't do it. Like I tried and I didn't want to do it. It would, which surprised me because, you know, I'd considered myself a very like spiritual person my whole life and obedient. And, and yet I couldn't do that. It was super uncomfortable. And I realized I had some fear. I had some fear of God. And I did um, a clearing exercise called write and burn, where you just write out all of your fears and the negative, you express the negative emotions that you're feeling just as a way of clearing them out of your mind and out of your body. And that really did help for sure. Um, for me, the second thing that I would say also is I think that we have this chasm, as you describe it, between us and the Lord, because we aren't understanding who he really is. I, I published a book last year. It's called Living in Your True Identity. And it's based on the principle that we all have two identities. One is true and one is false. Your true identity is your divine nature. And your false identity is what scripture refers to as the natural man or the flesh or psychology refers to as the ego. And most of my life, I didn't know that there was a difference. If I made a dumb choice or I reacted in a way that I was ashamed of, I thought that was who I really was instead of it being, that's not who I really am. The real me, the true me, the divine nature who God created me to be is always happy, always loving, kind, patient, has those attributes of our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. They need to be developed to a higher degree, yeah. but they're there and that's who I am. And that's what the book talks about is that difference between the true identity and the false identity. And then, but to, to pair that even more is that God has a true identity and we create a false identity for who he is. Our false self creates an yeah. image of who we think he is. And that's why I think we separate ourselves because we think he wouldn't want to be with me. I'm awful. I'm a sinner. He's disappointed in me. Like he doesn't want to be with me. But as soon as we start to clear away that false image that we've created and we get to know who he really is, that he is always loving, that he's merciful and kind, that he's our father and that he loves us. Then and also, also that he's very down to, to earth. Share. For me, I, I had to, yeah, to even yeah. feel like when, when I think of a, uh, a figure I'm close to, it's someone I can be down to earth with, like who gets mm -hmm. my humor, who mm -hmm. accepts all my, you know, all my quirks and faults. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. So for me, I couldn't just look at God and Jesus. So we'll, we'll, we'll go with Jesus. Like that's why Jesus is our mediator because he had this body and he came here. And, and for me, I had to like, look at the human messiness piece of spirituality for me to heal as a woman. And that's why I love Mary Magdalene so much mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because it's like, yeah, Hey, that's sacred too. You know, that it's not all just love light, you know, pure it's, it's what if this other element is just as sacred to God and that I don't have to be quote unquote uber worthy to share in the healing power or to be in the presence, just friend to friend or daughter 
and uh, daughter parents. So I, I just wanted to insert that too, because when I started working this, with these women over the years, it felt like I'm going to put my humanness aside for a second and just be in this love light truth space so that I can connect in. Mm-hmm. And then, and what you said earlier was really powerful when you said, as I am, you know, connecting to God right now, exactly as I am yeah. right now. And this is why people that are in the throes of re- addiction recovery, they've learned this the hard way. When they disconnect, it looks like addiction. They know that that's where the very first step in the AA um, 12 steps is we recognize <laughs> We now know <laughs> that we need this higher power, that a power greater than ourselves, I believe yeah. is how it's worded. So even if, and that's the beauty of, of this earth space is, man, I'm, I've got a messy life. So I'm not going to wait until I'm feeling all, woo, um, to connect <laughs> in. <laughs> And, and so, so I, I guess love- I'm kind of double speaking here because in one breath I'm saying, okay, well, you got to be in a certain mind space, you know, to really feel God and like feel the answer. And then on the other hand, I'm saying, hey, but connect in as you are. So it's, it, it can be, maybe we just make a sweeping statement, like no matter what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> find that breath. Well, I would love that. to speak. Yeah. I would love to speak to just your comment on worthiness. And I think it's true that you have to be clean to be in the presence of God. But I think we have a misunderstanding of what that really is. Like we can, we can blow that up and think it, it means perfect. It means fully developed. It means, you know, I've done all these things when really my belief is that worthiness and cleanliness is 100% only a matter of which identity you're in in that moment. If you're in your true self, which you can get to as fast as breathing, <laughs> if you're in your true identity, then you are in that space that is clean and is whole and is always clean and whole. But if you're in that natural man, if you're in that place that is an enemy to God, you cannot be in the same space because that's not truth that's not who he created you to be and so when i when i talk about worthiness i i want it to be really clear that it's just a state and it's which state or which identity you're in are you in that false self or are you in your true self and as soon as i can get to that true space which for me is three deep inhales and inhales and exhales and i'm in that true space of who i really am and light and life I'm worthy. I'm here. I am me. I still have my quirks, like you say, and my personality and what makes me unique, but I'm in the space that I am clean and worthy. And it is the power of Jesus Christ that brings us into that space. He's redeeming us from this natural man, this false self into back into restoring the word redemption, you know, means get back. It's like, get back to who you really are. Yeah. So, to that's me, what, that's, yeah, but, that's all repenting is, is just connecting back in and it's instantaneous. It's not meant to be a brutal yes. punishment cycle. Right. Um, I love what you're saying. So, right. Okay. So how, so if we're talking about like meditation made simple, <laughs> I think we're simplifying <laughs> it for people. Like that's it, right? It's, it's just stop. I have a, my own mantra, stop, breathe, and receive. I think I made it up, but maybe somebody else has it out there somewhere. I like it because it rhymes. Mm-hmm. It's my personal mantra. Just yeah. stop, breathe, receive. Um, because for me, I need to receive the breath of life more fully. And when I br- receive that breath of life more fully, then I am now armed to be loving to people. I'm now armed to receive insights because I've received that outside power, which is also generated within me. But I lack, if I'm in a space where I know I lack the ability in a moment to know the best way or to feel a certain way or to get out of my ego state, as you put it, 
I, mm-hmm. I need help. I need to surrender in that moment. So that's like a spiritual timeout for me. So my mantra is just stop, <sighs> breathe, and then receive. So in my mind, I see yeah. a waterfall, like, a. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm, and then like, I'm stopping and I'm like letting the water fall, um, the living water you could say. And then I'm in the pool and I'm just bathing in it, drinking it's pure. So that's my way of sort of like doing the spiritual timeout to get in the right space. And it took me a while yeah. to form. I like to have people formulate their own. Like I love yeah. yours. It was given to you. Um mm-hmm. So if we're going to say meditation made simple as a practice now moving, moving into more of a, um, a Christ centered meditation as a prayer, as you phrased it, which I love, how, how, what does that look like? Meditation made simple for me at the very, very simplest level is the breath that we've been talking about. And I love your imagery of what it looks like for you to receive that. And like you say, I think all of us could come up with our own imagery of what it looks like to be receiving that breath of life. And the very simple meditation that I give in my class that I teach is the mantra, I love and accept you and state your name. So for me, every morning for five minutes, it's, I love and accept you, Brooke. And the neat thing about this, especially as a beginning mantra, and and I say beginning, but I've been doing this exact meditation for nearly four years now. So (laughs) like, I don't, I don't plan on stopping. (laughs) Like this is one that is so foundational to my experience. But the, the reason I like this is that it, it deals with the worthiness that we've just talked about because I'm restating to myself, I love and accept you. There's a lot that can be included in there and including worthiness, right? I love you, Brooke. I accept you. And on that repetition, I can imagine I'm saying it to myself or I can also imagine that the Lord is saying it to me. And to, to kind of go between those two places, both of them I think are important. I need to be able to say that to me. And I also need to be able to hear that from the Lord and to actually repeat it, visualizing and that he's saying that to me is a really powerful experience. Um, Mm. For me, that's, that's a a great, I don't, I just repeat it in my mind. You can say it out loud, just depends on Depends on the moment. What is right in that moment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So you do. You, um, I actually had a mentor tell me one time to say, "I am God in the mirror," and mm-hmm. I know it sounds heretical to some people. So it was like you had to be see the context of our conversation um, because I was experiencing deep feelings of inadequacy about connection with God, not because I felt like I had sinned. I just felt I'd somehow disconnected and I couldn't plug the, you know, plug the thing back in the electric socket to feel God. And so I had tried all these things and, and this mentor said, yes, if you look in the mirror and say, I am God. And it took, I kid you not. I I tried it for like, four days. And I was like, Nope, I'm not feeling it. This feels so heretical. But by about the fifth or sixth day, this flood of, um, beautiful, uh, this flow of just peace just washed over. And it was like the feel, the, the phrase that came into my mind is this, I am in you and you are in me. We are one. And so by me saying, I am God, which felt so awkward and like literally um, self-aggrandizing became this beautiful new truth that I internalized, but I had to, I had to go through a thing of like speaking out and looking in the mirror. Um, So that's why I asked you because I think that phrase, I love and accept you uh, and saying that to yourself is so powerful because it's the feelings of unworthiness that we talked about before that keep us from, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. It's interesting, you know, with that phrase to that mantra, <laughs> funny little story. I, I did that meditation every day for five minutes for about two years. And then I, I taught a class and <laughs> it was a class on identity. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I've probably, I've probably like, if, if meditation is like a reservoir, I've probably, or a bank account, like I've, I've got a lot of reserves here. <laughs> I don't need to keep, I don't need to keep doing this little meditation. I can move on to another kind of meditation. And so, and I did, I love, I loved and accepted myself. I was feeling confident and in a great place. And so I stopped doing it, um, in favor of doing some other stuff. And it's so funny because within six weeks, I noticed like I had really dropped in my ability to love and accept myself. And I realized from that experience, I'm like, oh, this isn't something that I just like build up and then I coast for a while or that I'm good. <laughs> There's <laughs> Satan who is like always attacking our identity and our ability to love and accept ourselves all the time, all day long. Right. And so I realized yeah. from that experience, that this is foundational to my experience every single day. Like that's why I do it every day, even though I've meditated for four years, even though, as you say, I'm a meditation expert, like I teach meditation to people. This is why I start with this meditation and it's still what I practice today. I have other things I like to add in, but I always do this as my bare minimum if I'm not going to get anything else done today with meditation, I at least do that. And, and how long, how long does that typically take you? I, uh, I invite our class to do it for five minutes a day, but honestly, even just a few minutes, like imagine all the messages that we get all day long. Like, especially if you're on social media, or you're on TV, like anywhere where there's media at all, you're being fired so many messages every single day, most of which the high majority are negative and untrue. Yeah. And so to me, it's like, if I can spend some time to repetitively install a true belief, one of the most important beliefs that I can have, and I repeat it every single day, I need that to empower me to be able to have discernment, but also to just get through the day and have that playing in my mind rather than other things that could be playing in my mind. Awesome. So coming back into more of the structure, if we could kind of, I know that you offer things on your website, correct? Can you direct us to your website? Yeah. yeah Brooksnow.com is my website. I have a meditation class if people are more interested in being able to learn more about that. And it also is a 40 day challenge. And just because I know that a practice needs consistency for you to be able to see the results with that. And anytime you start a new practice can be hard to be consistent with it and to, to start a new habit. And so I actually offer a free buddy pass to everyone who signs up, which means you get to invite your own friend or family member to do the course with you. And that's your accountability partner. You're, <laughs> you're both going to do the 40 day challenge. You can keep each other accountable, share what you learn, share some of your experiences. You get to pick the person that you love and trust to be able to do that with you. And I, I've seen some amazing things happen just with that. And people's, it, it's always interesting too, to see who they pick as their partner um, and the growth that happens for two people instead of just one. So that's a, a great opportunity if that's something of interest to learn more about that practice. Awesome. Yeah, I would love to, I was supposed to come to your retreat that you did at our friend Kelly's and I didn't make it that day and I wanted to so badly because I resonate with your way of, of seeing this as a sacred act of prayer, more um, connecting in and keeping Christ as the focus. I know different people have different um, deity figures that they attach to and mine is definitely Christ. Mine is also Mary Magdalene. I believe she was kind of a Christ figure for the feminine and they were definitely in, in, in cohorts together. I guess you could say they were mm. teamed up. <laughs> um, and what I do know is when I brought the feminine in and it wasn't just male centric, um, I, I don't necessarily want to say prayer. I mean, you could call it prayer. It was more like, I have questions and 
um, I also honor the feminine too. So it wasn't necessarily like, you know, uh, traditional worship or traditional prayer as much as it was, Hey, I really want to connect in to the divine mother, to heavenly mother, to Mary Magdalene. And sometimes it will be, um, just, you know, my ancestors that are women, because I want to feel that flow too. Have you, do you have any, is that something you've explored or has that come up for any of your clients or in any of your clients? Absolutely. It's interesting that you do bring that up and going back to that original mantra of I love and accept you and state your name. I mentioned how you can say that for yourself and how you can imagine that the Lord is saying that to you. Early on in my experience with that meditation, I I would have a visualization and I would visualize that Jesus was saying these words to me. And then I did imagine that Heavenly Mother was there and she was saying these words to me. And then Heavenly Father was there and he was saying these words with me. So that was my first experience with having a a spiritual connection to the feminine, to Heavenly Mother. And it was it was amazing. And it was interesting because that was a, that's something I've actually never shared before <laughs> with anyone. So this podcast is the first time I've Well, you know, I, I love it. And thank you for sharing that because I, I like to draw that out. Um, because I think a lot more women are having these experiences, but we feel like we can't talk about it. And Mm -hmm. I believe it's the era of the feminine and it's time that she wants to be not, you know, maybe not mentioned just as much as like revered and honored for how, because she wants us to feel empowered as women. So Thank you for sharing that. And it's so interesting. Sometimes for some people, especially if they've been wounded by a male figure, let's say they had a rejecting father or they were part of a sexual assault um, by a male, they will often not feel safe even with Jesus or God. But if you bring in a feminine presence to connect in, that that feel, they can go right there. They could... Mm feel that closeness and feel the flow of the the mother as well as the father coming in when they can um, take out the male. And then eventually when they heal it, they can, you know, come back to that. But for me, I feel like that's what's been left out um, since the Nicene Creed. And even before that, it's, it's the feminine's been left out. And so we want to nestle yeah. into our mother. We, we want to find that connection to the feminine. So for some people, bringing in both mother and father into their practice has been really a beautiful healing opportunity for them. Well, for me, this kind of comes for full circle of what we were talking about at the beginning of how I view what the gospel is, you know, that we have the deity and then it's us as an individual and then church as a supportive foundation underneath. I feel like as I have kind of made that transition of exploring my own personal relationship that I am more freely able to explore and to have these experiences with Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother and be able to have conversations (laughs) that, you know, like our earlier conversation about prayer being about listening to. And it's been wonderful to be able to have those personal experiences. I know it's I'm thinking of a quote right now from the prophet Joseph Smith and I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said that you would learn more by gazing into heaven for five minutes Mm -hmm. than you would in an entire lifetime of reading anything that's been written of God. Mm -hmm. And to me, what I, what I receive out of that quote is that, when you see into heaven, it's because you are having a personal experience in that moment. Mm. And it's through the personal experience that you learn. It's not, it, it, that is more experiential than I'm just reading about something. But when you go into that place, when you're in your, your true identity, which is whole and worthy, and you are connecting with Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother and Jesus Christ, and you have those 
conversations. <laughs> you can speak yeah. and you can listen and you can learn. You learn a whole lot more in that five minutes of that experience than you do reading anything that's mm. been written. And Beautiful. so for me, it's, it's all about the experience. It's how can I have an experience with the Lord and not just read about him? How can I actually know yeah. him? And that's what mysticism, that's the definition of mysticism. Um, and you look at like Joan of Arc, you look at Hildegard, you look at Jillian of Norwich and all these feminine mystics, female mystics back in the, the times where they were being suppressed by the Catholic church and told they had to go through a priest or the church at the time, which was Catholicism to find God. They were actually reprimanded for praying. Um, so they did all of these you know, forbidden prayers in their secret chambers. And that's basically how mysticism was born as a, as a, I guess you could mm. say, a, you know, kind of a, its own entity in terms of direct experience. So yes. And yeah. I think, I think we're coming to a place on the planet where we have to find that for ourselves. We can no longer use supports to give us our spirituality, it must yeah. come through direct experience because there's so much happening. And I think, I mean, as I look back on like growing up, the world was, yeah, it was chaotic, you know, and there was, you know, all these things happening. But right now with technology, especially with smartphones and social media, if we don't know how to feel God, and I mean in the sensory rich way of that direct experience you're referencing, yeah, we yeah. will be disconnected and we will feel hollow. And mm -hmm. I know, I know, I can get into that so fast. As even I consider myself like a spiritual teacher, I guess, but I can get into that that emptiness so fast. And I'm like, what's happening? It's like, oh gosh, when was the last time I really intentionally connected in? And I, and I, I take it for granted mm -hmm. that it will always be there. Um, and then the ego just overrides my whole life. And then I'm like running in circles of wondering why I'm so stressed out. <laughs> it's like, duh, practice what you <laughs> preach, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> we all need those reminders. <laughs> oh, we do. Well, is there anything else you would leave us with that um, might be pertinent to the discussion as we kind of round out meditation made simple? Um, I just love the whole idea of it just being breathing in mantra and connecting in on the run. Um, but is there anything else that you would add to that aside from people visiting your site and getting to the real meat of a, a structured practice? I would say it all comes back to love. Mm. And to me that that's what we all at the deepest level want to access is love for ourself and love for God and love for those around us. That's what the greatest commandment is, is love. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that the more we can do to have practices like daily practices in our life that connect us to love, that we will be able to progress. We'll be able to be happy. We'll be able to have the connection that we need with God and with ourselves and with people around us. And it's simple. Like everything is simple. It's as simple as breathing. And it's as simple as just love is the answer. And yeah. that's, if we can find that alignment, then we're good. Which is the whole thing Christ was about. And yeah, that's why he that's why he said that was the first and great commandment was to love. It's, it's what meditation right. is trying to bring us to, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. For I sure. love it. Well, thank you, Brooke. You've been delightful to talk to And I, I love your philosophies and your depth. And I definitely think you could, do you ever do virtual workshops, by the way, or are they mostly physical location based um i do online courses but i and like in person retreats when someone invites me i'm not a planner so i don't usually <laughs> plan the details of things like that yeah. but the thing i love about working in in an experience like an online class is just that you have time to see results and time to yes. implement 
the things that we learn. And that to me is where really exciting transformation happens. So rather than like when, I mean, one day events can be inspirational and all of that too, but I just love the experiences where you can meet continually over time. For sure. In the online course experience or otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that. All right. So Thank you again, Brooke. And um, I'm going to be connecting with you in person because I just had an idea. So <laughs> dangerous. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to hear. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Yeah. Thank you. You too. I love this discussion today on Meditation Made Simple. And I encourage you to go to her site, brooksnow.com. You'll see some resources there and some freebies. My personal mantra, Stop, Breathe, and Receive, I believe came to me in a moment where I was very vulnerable and needing something that was super quick. So that's the power of mantra. Um, The shorter, the better. The brain can't register a whole lot at once if it wants to be still. And I think we clutter our minds with too much information. And I'm raising my hand here because I am constantly doing that. But just the gospel of love coming back into connection and living out from a space of presence is how we maintain that peace and that everyday happiness. Best of wishes to you for a beautiful week. And we'll connect again next week on Women Seeking Wholeness Wednesday.